Good morning. My name is Michael Dorf. Um, uh, here to welcome you to uh, this session where we will hear Suzanne Weeks uh, talk about education and mathematics, um, but not what we, I guess, normally think of as mathematics education. Uh, Suzanne Weeks, or Susie Weeks, is CEO of SIAM, the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Before that, she was uh, assist, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies at Worcester Polytech, uh, WPI, and while she was there, she was instrumental in uh, promoting and helping students succeed in undergraduate research, especially undergraduate research related to uh, big business, industrial, and government type problems. Uh, her research is in differential, numerical methods and differential equations, which not surprisingly has uh, applications to problems that are applied. Um, she is an excellent teacher and excellent speaker. Um, she's also done a lot at the national level to promote uh, mathematics in the mathematics community. She was a um, co-founder, I believe, and co-director of uh, MSRI Up to promote mathematics opportunities for underrepresented groups. She is, I know this one for sure, she is a co-director and co-founder of PICMATH, Preparations for Industrial Careers um, in the Mathematical Sciences to help, help uh, undergraduate students succeed in uh, getting jobs, in non-academic jobs. Um, and she is on the Board of Governors of Tipsy Math, Transforming Post-Secondary Education in Mathematics. Uh, on a personal note, I would say uh, Susie is in my Hall of Fame of living famous mathematicians. Uh, some, sometimes we think, go ahead, clap for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will say that she is a great colleague and friend of mine. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susie. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I want to meet that me. Yep, that sounds. <laughs> so. okay. All right. So I have done what I would go nuts if my students did, which is I prepared so many slides. Some of them have too many words, but I'm glad that you're all here. And I know there are many other um, choices you could make. So thank you for. Uh, I should feel like an airline. Thank you for flying with us. And you saw the sign with the exits, look behind you, look in front, so it's just like an, an airline. So here we go. Thanks very much. So yes, my talk is, and you can hear me okay, um, mathematics in and for the real world. And thank you, Michael, again, for that lovely introduction. So I always, and, and, and I'm here representing, you know, well, I'm employed by SIAM. And as Michael said, of most of my career, a lot of my career, um, even as an academic, so I was 25 years at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and it's very much part of our um, WPI's DNA to connect theory and practice. And in the math department, we did quite a lot of that, connecting what we did in the classroom to what goes on in the real world in, um, in industry. And so and I've been a member of SIAM for forever as a, you know, my first conference was um, a SIAM conference. My first paper was in a SIAM journal. And so it's an honor for me to be um, uh, the CEO of SIAM. And you can see what our mission is here, right? To advance the application of math and computational science to engineering, industry, science, and society to promote research and to provide the media um, for communication, right? And of course, visit us at SIAM.org. Um, so um, how many, how many, um, let's see. Yeah. How many of you are Gen X or approximate out here? So for the Gen X people, so the title of my slide, the title of my talk is Mathematics in and for the Real World. So I'm gonna start by first 
Apollo, thank you, Suzanne, but many people didn't watch TV. So if any of you are thinking that I'm gonna talk about the original or best reality show ever, MTV, The Real World, um, I wanna, um, sorry, apologize from the start. So it's really, let me just call it The Real World. You know, I'm gonna lowercase the R and lowercase the W. And I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm not gonna talk so much about education, educational philosophy and, a, and education research because I feel like I'm not qualified to do that. But again, connecting um, real world industry problems, real applications to what we do with our students is what um, I can talk about. And in particular, I want to um, highlight something we did in October of 2022, the SIAM convening on climate science um, clean energy and sustainability, because we came up, um, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. I will talk about the PIC math program that Michael mentioned a little briefly about that. Um, some, things, some programs that we, we work with our partners on, graduate student math modeling camp, math problems in industry, um, et cetera. And so, yeah, in fine print there, when I think of what we do in professional societies, and SIAM in particular, I think about community. Community is a big thing, right? I've talked to many people, everybody's happy to get together to network here. It's about a community, whether we're doing education, research, or becoming fast friends. And at SIAM in particular, we are about solving real problems, the research, the education, and a lot, we do quite a lot with um, partnerships and advocacy work, and of course we communicate all these things. So we had a SIAM convening on climate science, sustainability, and clean energy in, you know, in October, just over a, a year ago. And this is one of the statements that was part of this um, long report that we generated. So, and this is part of what, what I put in the abstract to this talk, right? Work to prepare for complex futures is timely, given the recent global examples of extreme weather, et cetera, right? So of course, that convening, convening was focused on, um, um, climate science and all these sorts of things. But the notion of a complex future, right? We could have switched things right now. I usually don't go an hour without saying artificial intelligence. So we can slip in artificial intelligence, right? We can slip in any one of those things that, we, uh, that, we, that are on our mind. We need to prepare for complex futures. We need, the second paragraph is extremely important, to ensure that students in all majors develop an awareness and they're you know, fully capable to take up the challenges that we, what, that we um, are faced with. And the part that I enjoy is that interdisciplinarity of things, right? The interdisciplinary courses. And as um, Michael said, I love, I love a project. <laughs> I love a student project, right? Student research. So I'd like to focus on the SIAM uh, um, convening. So we were looking at we started off with the mindset that research and education is necessary to address the big problems that we have, right? Think of any big problems. And mathematics is part of this, right? Um, if we're just looking narrowly right now, mathematics is part of that. At SIAM, we're much broader than mathematics. Well, lots of dis disciplines that involve mathematics. And of course, we can't talk climate science, sustainability, and clean energy in any sort of vacuum. It can't just be the geologists or the geophysicists. All of us have to come together. So that's what we tried to do, to bring um, a, a multidisciplinary group of folks together to identify and, um, and articulate, the re articulate the research needs that there are to address such problems, understand the challenges, really lay things out. Um, and the, we were delivering this to um, at least US funding agencies, in particular the National Science Foundation, to help them um, do things that will help us solve the problems that we need, right? So we needed to hear from a nice bunch of people. And of course, identify the mechanisms to encourage the growth and health of the research workforce. Um, and again, we have a report, white papers and presentations available at siam.org. And so as a, we brought a bunch of people together and said, Let's work and get something out as best as possible in three and a half days. So any of you who've worked with a bunch of people <laughs> um, with a concrete goal know you can use some help. So I, I must uh, mention No Innovation, which is the, uh, the professional facilitators that we use. And I give them a lot of credit for keeping the energy up, 
keeping us um, focused um, and helping us get the job done. We started off with the steering committee, right? Some of, maybe some of you know some of um, these names. You, na you know at least one, the one, the second to last one. Um, there's somebody there who's my neighbor, lives a, uh, who's an economist on that list. I won't point out which one of those is my neighbor and friend. Um, some of you in Siam certainly know Hans Kopper, anybody who does anything about material science and, um, and mathematical understanding of what's going on in the Arctic will recognize, do you know the name, anybody? Ken Golden, right? So many, many people, um, a few people on the steering committee and we had about 58 um, par persons participate in the convening. So who were they? Who were they? About 50 people um, would place their jobs in, or their PhDs actually, in the mathematical sciences. About a quarter were engineers. We had economists and social scientists, chemists, you know, physical scientists, etc. cetera, right? Um, people at various stages. We had some senior people, about 60% of them were senior researchers. We had early career, a few retired, and about, again, 60 percent of people, I should have said percent, not 60 people, 60 percent of people were academics, some working in government, some working in the private sector, um, in oil companies, et cetera. And this is a group shot of those who listened and paid attention to the fact that we were going to have a group shot, right? <laughs> not everybody was there. <laughs> Good. So uh, on day one, we had our call to action. The day one, we had our call to action. And, you know, again, October 2022, this is not, um, we could probably have similar headlines and di or different, but similar in some sense, headlines today, right? Different climate issues. So that was a great motivation. And we wanted to take ambitious leaps to see uh, in this convening, it's not, oh, tell us what your favorite research problem is. Be ambitious. What are the things that we need to do? Um, to engage the research community to solve the problems that we have for climate change, climate equity and justice, food security, et cetera. Our goal and the opportunity was to expand the range of actionable scientific research, broaden the participation of scientists, policymakers, and we wanna move quickly, right? We wanna see what we can do to move um, quickly to solve problems. We have real problems that need to be solved. You see what the risks are? Um, right, we need to, to think big. If we're getting together and trying to solve problems, we ought, we have to think big. Don't wanna take these incremental steps. We are um, too far gone to be just thinking little and small scale to solve problems that we need. Wanna look at what research, technology, scientific gaps, collaboration, basic science. So all these things were listed as things we wanted to address. You can see why you need a professional facilitator to keep people on track to make as much progress as we could, okay? And I'm not expecting you to read all the words in the slides. I'm not reading all the words in the slides, okay. We organize our discussions around advancing scientific knowledge, anticipating future conditions, accelerating clean energy innovation, sustainable practices, climate resistance, climate change resilience, increasing that. And of course, we can't do anything without considering the people who are working on this, right? So we wanna know what um, sort of outreach we can do to engage our communities, our students, our researchers, and broader impacts. Okay, so it was a wonderful, energizing time, right? The people, the people, the ideas, right? We had lots of ideas, lots of sticky notes, walls covered in stuff, and they all converged, believe it or not, they converged. Um, so we have day one, day, um, day two, we thought big, we had these things called wib geese in red there, wouldn't it be great if such and such could happen? And we you know, think big. And we came up with nine ideas, and I'll list the nine ideas and go into a little bit of detail about those nine ideas. Um, and eventually day three, we had some oral presentations and reports, we captured all that, all those things are available on the Climate Science Convening website. So we have a lot of material and collateral. We welcome you to take a look at them and see. All right, so again, just what does this have to do with education, right? And if you are an educator, well, 
You're the one helping to motivate students, prepare students to go out and do something hopefully productive in, um, in the world. And this is a source of problems that need to be worked on. It is a source, a lot of it involves mathematics, a lot, a lot of it involves new mathematics that needs to be, um, to be addressed. And part of what we do as professional societies, going back to what professional societies do, is to advocate, right? We wanna advocate for education, advocate for research, and that means advocating for where s dollars that are supporting the research go. And this, this is an important goal, so this is all what we're working towards. All right. And if you have QR codes, I'll put this up several times. If you have, I guess we don't have Wi-Fi, but cellular, you can grab and get the link for that. All right. So the nine recommendations that these 50-something people came up with after um, maybe, I guess it was just about two and a half days, um, these are the nine recommendations we were able to present to, uh, in our report and to the National Science Foundation, which is a paradigm for digital twins. We can talk a little bit about what digital twins are. A paradigm for digital twins to safeguard the planet. Other one, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Yes, the Arctic is far away, but we, hopefully we know by now, when we mess with that, the, the effects are global, right? Transforming education to address complex futures. Is there work that we need to do in our educational system? The uh, extreme learning, and I'll explain what that meant. Um, it didn't mean like fast, fast learning. We're not talking, right? But I'll tell you. The end of fossil fuels, plain and simple. Accelerated circular economy development. Uh, reduce, there are many R's in that one. Reduce, reuse, recycle. We hear about recycle a lot. But how about reuse? What do we do with that? Um, so we'll, I, I may quickly touch on that. A sustainable water grid and then unraveling the climate vulnerability web, integration of physical, biological, human, social, and economical, economic models in time and space, and changing the conversation at the local level. So I'm gonna give you a bottom line in case you tune out, right? I like to give the uh, kind of a bottom line up front. There's a need for, and I'll say this again, inter, multi, and transdisciplinary collaborations, right? None of this is going to be done just by mathematicians, just by data scientists, just by chemists. We have to talk and work together. And I think that's, that's true for any problem, any real problem that we need to solve. We need a broad-based research portfolio to make a foundation for science-based decision-making. We need to, of course, very important, for this AMS lecture on education, we need to educate a workforce capable and willing to engage in these activities. Do we have an alternative? We, we have to do this, right? These problems need to, well, we could not solve the problems. We know where that, we know the ending point for that. But, so we, we do need to, in my opinion, just my opinion, um, um, engage a workforce capable of doing this. Well, it's not just my opinion, of course, right? And we need to better connect local and regional stakeholders to the research community. Are we still, are we, are we with me? Yeah, good. So let's talk a little bit about one of the first ideas, a paradigm for digital twins to safeguard the planet. Who knows what a digital twin is? Or who doesn't know what a digital twin is? D who doesn't know, right? Good, um, good. So let's talk about digital twins. So digital twins and quantum and AI and all these things, those are one of the, you know, those are some terms that get thrown around, right? Let me just tell you what the statement and the next slide we'll talk a little bit about digital twin just for um, half a minute. But their statement is we need to develop a multi-fidelity, whatever that means, it means you know, different levels of accuracy, scalable, long-lived open source platform um, that enables systemic analysis of Earth system processes. From this platform, scientists will be able to build problem-specific digital twin. So we're thinking of, we wanna see what's going on with the earth. We wanna make predictions or remediation or strategies. So a digital twin, think of it as a computational model of the earth, continuously informed by data. 
well, the Earth is hella complex. That's why you need, uh, it's gonna be humongous, open source, um, you know, information from everywhere. Let's see. Let's get the formal de definition. A digital twin is a virtual representation, of, well, one definition coming from IBM, that spans its life cycle is updated from real-time data and uses simulation, machine learning, and reasoning to help decision making, right? Oh yeah, I mentioned AI, I didn't mention machine learning before. All this, I'm gonna call this kind of new stuff, right? I don't think of myself as that old, but I guess I am, and I'm firmly middle-aged or whatever, but there's, I feel like there's so much new stuff. There's so much new computational science questions, so much new mathematics questions, and that's what this is all about. I'm hoping to headline some of these things. Okay, I'm having a slight wardrobe malfunction here, um, so I apologize for that. Um, and here's another definition of a digital twin, and we've had a few articles in Siam News, scinews.siam.org, that you could read some more of what digital twins are. So you see here this aircraft, right? That's a computational, you know, um, you know, that's a gridded model, but it's being informed by data regularly. You can imagine doing a digital twin of an aircraft, a bio, of, of a heart, right? How a heart's beating and um, use that to have maybe more personalized me um, medicine and inform um, solutions for treatment, et cetera. Okay, so you can read more about that. And again, my goal here, you can catch whatever information you can for the slides, but hopefully you leave here thinking maybe I have a conversation with my students or a conversation with my um, faculty member or do some Googling yourself about digital twins. Maybe that's something um, that's of interest to, for your research. Okay. And then they have this graphic, how would digital twins enter into the kind of work we're looking at for climate science? You'd, um, such a thing would detect changes in the climate science, measure the response, de-risk through uncertainty aware, inform policy decisions. You have this live living model. Again, it will be huge. It's not gonna be one group doing it. It's gonna be um, a sort of global effort that we're all feeding into. Who needs to be involved in this effort, right? Certainly mathematical modelers, physicists, chemists, statisticians, scientific domain experts, so if you're just thinking of a modeling the, the earth or whatever, you need everybody engaged, it's a complex thing. Social scientists, software engineers, right? Massive computing, long-term investment. What do we mean by long-term? On the order of 100 years, right? This is not a build this next year and just leave it alone, continuous, right? We wanna have a re sort of real model guiding data principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's the FAIR data principles, okay? And you can imagine um, the impact, the use, the t if you have this model that's informed from real data, so if we go to the second bullet point, detecting the change, the tipping points, that's gonna send us into, you know, wonderful situation or absolute disasters, right? And, but we need to develop those mathematical and statistical models um, to um, continuously adapt, okay? All right, QR code, if you wanna get some more information. Good, and oh, so I'm not, I haven't been explicitly naming the people who've been work, who've worked on, who decided to work on each of those problems and develop those ideas, but uh, the slides are here, so pardon me for not reading off their names. And then this one is about what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And you can see this photo here. Um, so top corner, that area is Arctic. And you can look at the recent, the Arctic is ground zero for climate change. And you could see what are the recent losses compared to the United States, massive, right? All right. And understanding signature of the indicators of planetary warming. You can look at the micro level and build up to many different scales. It's, you know, you can look at this as material science, climate science, all these things, but it's happening at different scales, from micro to macro in the Arctic science. And so we need to develop different models, different predictions to understand that, right? Our students, and well, we all do, I hope, care about, care about what's happening in the Arctic, what's happening in the, um, 
in our climate, what's happening for clean energy, sustainability. So these notions and these letting them know about these ways that they can get involved, um, modify what we're teaching, the research that we're doing can um, help this effort. Okay. So um, you can have what's the term, you can look at multi-scale hierarchical modeling. The word modeling is always gonna come up, right? And what goes, right, and a model is not a single differential equation, it could be, it ha has lots of things that go into it. Right, but to understand what's going on and how to describe what the physics and the chemistry and everything involved. Tear joker, tear jerker photo. Is everyone engaged? Right, it's important. Okay. Okay. Then we have transforming education to address complex futures. And I think this this would have been um, where I took the quote from the very beginning from my abstract from this um, this group. And again, I emphasize collaborative approach to curricular classes pedagogy, right? So this is kind of disruptive, isn't it, to how we do things, right? We've, some of us are, you know, you, if you're, you're barely trying to get through the stuff you have to do, much less saying, I'm gonna go work with a chemist and talk to them about problems, or talk with an engineer, or talk to an economist. But I think it really is essential for us to, to move forward and really have an impact with the, with the work that we do, the mathematics that we do. Right? Today's students often find it difficult to place coursework into a broader context and synthesize subject areas, so we have to do something a little bit disruptive, um, and as you know, Michael and I have talked about, projects are one way, so it's not maybe in a standard curriculum, certainly projects are one way. I know Pad Padu Seshire does his, with his research students, have them work on research problems to address the grand challenges and things like that, so we do need to move Long. And so again, thinking big, they're thinking of a pilot program, right? If they're talking to the NSF or, um, or other funding agency, can you fund several schools to develop and ex assess curricular change? Can you gather input, right? So there's some organizations that are doing this already, trying to gather input from industry to know what is needed, what is the demand? What do they need their workers to come in knowing, if at po all possible? So you have to think about changing the curriculum and course adaptation. And they like to say train faculty to develop thinkers, right? Um, you wanna take in, you know, yeah, we've, we've, I've heard this many times, right? So there's, and we may have had discussions at this meeting about this, but there's so much literature, there's a whole field called math education, and do, um, do higher ed, math departments and math faculty take in all that pedagogy to really, um, well, we do develop thinkers in some way, but are there better ways to do the work that we do, okay? And then, of course, people say, um, well, if I can do all these different efforts with my limited time, is it valued by the university when it's time for promotion or assessment in what I'm doing? Is that, um, is that valued? So, and of course, the university has to be, to be committed to all these changes. And of course, so th this, they're laying out a, a roadmap for a pilot, um, and then of course you need to assess it and redo it and improve, and can it be replicated? And so maybe this is the last one I may um, spend some detail on. Um, Extreme learning, so that's the title, extreme learning, and it's not directly about how one learns, but the extreme effects that happen in our weather, right? So develop and apply novel mathematical and statistical techniques to capture, characterize, and predict extreme events, and we need more, so, uh, because what we're seeing are, like, yeah, so I guess the best word is extreme disruptive, um, and we need to know the statistics, we need to know the mathematics, because apparently that's not well developed yet to understand that, right? We probably understand um, the heck out of a normal, 
okay, or a Gaussian or whatever. But then now we're getting into the realm of these outliers that are extreme and how do we really understand these things. How can you quantify the likelihood of particular extremes given a non-stationary background, right? And obviously I'm not an expert in all this, I am reporting the work of others, so I will not be able to have a detailed conversation about this math these mathematical things. Okay, all right. Extreme weather events are a visible effect of climate change. Long-term prediction of extreme events is impossible. Short-term is merely hard. And here's one of my favorite actors, Will Ferrell from The Weatherman. And now the weather. It will be snowy unless it rains, right? That's really helpful. Um, and data for extreme events are sparse. They don't happen that often. Um, okay. You can read about all that. Again, the notion of tipping points came up quite a lot. Tipping points may introduce qualitative changes in the climate background. So how can we understand future extremes without knowing their background? They are interesting mathematical problems. They are new mathematical problems and avenues that come up from the real world and what we're experiencing. Okay, we want to anticipate future conditions, create scenarios for probability distribution of extremes, improve decision making, advanced scientific knowledge, include climate change resistance, once we understand all these things, to um, wildfires, drought, flooding, blizzards, hurricanes, all these things. I don't feel, um, I'm hope I'm not preaching doom and gloom on Jan, what day is today, January? Oh, I should know. January. Yeah, I know, right? But I don't, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to start the year in doom and gloom, and um, uh, yeah, yes I am, it is January 6th, but. Right, machine learning, math research, I think everybody gets it. There's a lot there, and um, there's a lot of work for us to do. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna reiterate what I said before, and thanks for those of you who stuck with it. Um, there, may, you know, there are several other recommendations, but we have a full report. We have a need for inter multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaborations. Um, Broad-based research portfolio or encourage you to educate a workforce capable and willing to engage in these activities. Okay. So pick math. So this is um, an initiative that um, Michael and I started with the help of others. It's a program of the MAA and SIAM and has been funded by the Division of Math Sciences of the NSF. We started this work in 2013. And it's about we, what we do, and Darren Narayan is here, and Tom Wakefield is the other co-directors, and we work um, with the staff at the MAA on this, and leadership. That PICMATH, we work directly with mathematical sciences faculty to help them prepare undergrads for the workforce, and ready to hit the ground running, we hope, by working on problems similar to the problem somebody quantitatively trained would work on in the workplace, right? They wanna graduate with a degree, we would love for them to have a resume that shows already, I can, I've worked on this problem, um, I've worked with others, come up with a solution. So we work with the faculty to then work with their students on this. And, and the structure that we've had is we have a three-day faculty training workshop um, for the, for in the summer. This is how the program starts. With, and then in the fall, so we do that in the summer, in the fall, faculty go off and try and connect with companies to say, we, I will have for you a bunch of students who would like to do some research. Do you have some problems that need some data analysis, some, something solid, right? Um, do you have some problems that need modeling? Do you have problems that we can work on, right? And um, at the beginning, when we started the program, we would find, uh, you know, we'd reach out to our friends and I'd have some reserve problems for, for faculty who are not successful in finding and connecting with industry. I haven't done that for the last um, few cohorts. Our fac the fa you know, and these are new faculty, but they've, they've gotten braver. They know how to go out, connect with industry. You talk to your alum, you talk to local agencies. Um, do you have a research problem that my students can work on? The students have to do written and oral solutions. They have to write it up. If you cannot communicate your work, 
your work is useless, right? So that's an important part, communication always. And we have student research presentations at the summer conference of the MAA at MathFest or at SIAM. This is our last cohort for this round of funding and they will be presenting at the SIAM annual meeting in Spokane, Washington in um, July of this year. So they'll be at the SIAM annual meeting. So I won't go into more deep, well, no, I do have a couple more slides about PIC math, but I just wanna say we've had seven cohorts of faculty and their students, and uh, we are proud and honored to have worked with over 230 different faculty uh, members, right? Representing 200 different universities and colleges around the United States. So uh, these are you know, colleges of um, all um, levels all over the US. Maybe we have some missing states at this point. We haven't done this, you know, which one of the 50 states and territories have missing. We've had faculty from Guam, right? Yep. Um, so these are faculty who've all had the opportunity. They've known how to go out to a company, get a, um, get a problem. I see some of our alum, our very successful alum, who have continued this program and continue doing this um, and built robust programs of their own based on their PIC math experience, so this is absolutely rewarding. 257, these are just rough numbers, I have it, so 257 plus, that's when I start counting, maybe at 257, research reports and um, videos that have been written by um, students. Um, student teams, over 204 different in industry partners have worked with, with the faculty and their students, okay? And just here, I'm definitely not gonna read this, but just, I just randomly selected projects, the title of projects, so you can just take, you know, just take a look at them and hopefully you can convey, this will convey the sort of problems students have, um, students and their faculty advisors have worked on. And a, another random sampling of the companies and organizations who have worked with the faculty and the students on research problems. These don't match what was on the previous slide. Again, I did a random um, selection. Oh good, Guam is on there, see? Proof, Guam Water Works Authority. Pro Football Focus, Texas Children's Hospital, United States EPA, et cetera. Um, gotta mention Siam journals. Um, so we love students doing, you know, I personally love students doing undergraduate research at, at, as Michael pointed out in the, in the introduction. And so we do encourage you, if you have students that are doing research, students who are here presenting at um, JMM, if it's appropriate, to the Siam undergraduate research journal online. Um, this is a reviewed journal, it's an online journal, not in um, paper or anything like that. And so doing, have your students submit their research, right, for publication. So, um, so I wanna talk about some, so the PIC math problem is for undergraduates. There's no, no reason you can't do that sort of things with graduate students. You have to work within your structure or whatever. At SIAM and, um, and with our friends, we do a graduate student mathematical modeling camp, which is a four day, so we do this one, uh, once a year, four day industrial modeling. What's modeling? I have a slide on what modeling, but a four day modeling camp for um, graduate students and sometimes advanced undergraduates. They come in, learn, get practice, how to formulate and analyze um, a problem, right? And you have the experienced mentors in order to develop solutions or approaches to give helpful answers to this. Right, team learning, always a thing. Communication, always a thing. Presentation skills, always a thing. And um, we've had support from NSF at times, and now we're looking for other sources. But this is very important. Our travel support and stipends are provided by the James Crowley Student Support Fund. James Crowley was the executive director of SIAM for 26 years, and upon his retirement, we developed um, a student support fund, and we use, we welcome donations. Um, because that helps support uh, <laughs> students to attend this camp. 
And this year, it will be in June at the University of Delaware, and we're accepting applications, and you see um, the link there, all right? Uh, and then, after the students, the graduate students go to this four-day workshop, they get to spend the week with, I call this the grown-up camp, right? So the graduate students in the grown-up camp. So it's a week-long industry study group, but basically about maybe four to five, sometimes five companies um, come, they bring a problem, and we have the researchers along with the students work on this problem to get real solutions or real approaches, and this is a week-long endeavor, okay? None of this, by the way, none of these problems I've talked about through the PIG Math program, program or these, this program are toy problems. It's always real, hence the real world, these are real problems. Um, the companies do not send their employees to come and present at the MPI, the Math Problems and Industry Workshop, just to keep us off the streets. They actually do it because there is value to it. They want solutions, they get solutions, they get something helpful, okay? They do not, they, want, they don't give problems to the PIG Math students also just to keep them off, off, off the streets. It is a service to the students and the community, but it's also the solutions are helpful for them. So this is real stuff. And we have um, support is provided by, we ask the problem solvers, the companies to pay fees, but again, we have to supplement things to balance the budget. So this year, the Math Problems and Industry Workshop will be in, um, in, at the University of Vermont, and we'll be opening up applications soon, right? So these are things you may wanna try as faculty, graduate students may wanna um, try, go to the workshop and then this, so please do um, do these things. And these are just four examples of some projects from various years at the Math Problems of Industry. And I've listed here my coll the colleagues who, and the team that organizes and runs the program. And Richard Moore from SIAM is here. Can you wave, Richard? Okay, so if you wanna talk, can you wave again? Just, you can bum rush him afterwards if you wanna talk, talk some more, right? Okay. I'm not sure how much time I, how much time do I, do I have? Who knows? 10, minutes. ten. oh great, 10 minutes, excellent. So I wanna shout out my friend Rachel Levy, who's now at North Carolina State University. Um, and Rachel was on the SIAM Committee on Education for, I don't know, many, many years, maybe over eight years. And she was a vice, vice president for education, volunteer leadership position at SIAM for um, three or three and a half years or so. Um, whatever that is, four years. Um, but in 2020, 2021, she was an American Math Society, AMS, and AAAS Science, Policy, Science, and Technology, Science and Technology Policy Fellow. And so in that was a stretch of an academic year. She worked in the office of Senator Hassan of New Hampshire. And Senator Hassan's, and her focus, Rachel's focus, was on health and education. And during that time, they were able to write and put together a bill with the help of the national, you know, with you know, the help of NSF people, national academies, you know, for expertise and stuff, put, write a bill that is being considered um, for, I guess, okay, I'm gonna sound childish, a bill that's considered to become a law, to grow up and become a law. Okay, um, and it went to the, so we're now in the 118th Congress, this went this work started in the last Congress, so last year or the year before. But I don't know if you can see this, but it's all laid out nicely like a bill, it's a longer thing. But what it is, is a Mathematical and Statistical Modeling Education Act. It was introduced to the 118th Congress in March 2023. Um, and the goal, the proposal is to coordinate federal research and development efforts focused on modernizing mathematics in STEM education through mathematical and statistical modeling. Why? Because we want to solve real problems, it's helpful. Including data-driven and computational thinking, problem, project, and performance-based learning and assessment, interdisciplinary exploration and career connections, and for other purposes. Okay, so this is the, um, this is the bill. It's, um, it has started its journey through the Senate, okay? It simultaneously is going through the House, and these are the senators up top to the right, or whatever direction that is. Those, those are the ones sponsoring the bill. 
and it's in the, in the Senate and the House of Representatives. It's a bipartisan um, effort, which is great. And what are the hiccups for this becoming a law? It's just, it needs to get through all the hoops within two years. Else it starts all over again, like it did last time. But this, this is an important effort. It shows what AAAS Professional Society, AMS Professional so Society, SIAM Professional Society is representing um, scientists, representing math communities. What we do is important, right? What we do affects the students that we're educating, right? So do get involved, do join your societies, do get active, and it's wonderful and, um, to see Dr. Levy um, have an impact, and hopefully this makes it through and we get federal support to do some innovations and different work um, in our K through 12 system. I don't, can you read any of this that's up here? All right, so this is some of the details um, in the bill, just some more. Mathematics taught in schools, in, including statistical problem solving and data science is not keeping pace with the rapidly evolving needs of the public and private sector. So that's what it's saying, et cetera, et cetera. Somewhere in there, there's an item five that says mathematical modeling. The term, the term modeling has the meaning given in the 2019 guidelines to assessment and inter instruction in mathematical modeling education, the game report, right? Why am I pointing this out? Because that's pretty exciting because the game report was an effort of COMAP and um, SIAM and um, hope, can you see some of the fine print and some of the names in there, all the pe some of the people that were involved in writing this thing? It's so cool. So I'm an, I'm an immigrant to the United States. It's so cool to see these, this bill written who be could become law that has work done by SIAM, work done by COMAP, and it's referenced in there. And it's not just to you know, make me feel, Susie feel, oh, how special, and I'm an American or whatever, but it's that the work that we're doing is having impact, and it's going um, further than our desks, right? And so that's the game report. And, um, and one of the, maybe the second to last thing I wanna talk about, right? So we've talked about undergraduates, we've talked about graduate students, we've talked about, um, um, faculty and researcher research. I wanna go a little bit into high school. One thing that we do at, and this, even the game report, this math modeling, it's math modeling in K through 12. That bill that Senator Hassan um, and her colleagues have put forward, it's about K through 12 education. And SIAM is definitely plays in this space through the MathWorks Math Modeling Challenge. It started off as a Moody's Math Modeling Challenge and now it's, we get support from MathWorks for the MathWorks Math Modeling Challenge. It's free for um, high school students to participate, completely internet-based. They get an open-ended modeling problem and get some resources to support that. They have teams, they work on this um, over a weekend. They have 14 hours, they choose whenever they wanna start and stop, but it's 14 hours. And um, we have, they are funds to provide scholarships to outstanding teams. I mean, not complete scholarships but you know, you get, give some financial help for, to, towards college tuition. All right, so we see, um, so obviously these photos were taken after 2020, you see the students trying to work together in their masks and all these things. You can um, take a look at the M3 challenge, M M3 challenge, MathWorks Math Modeling Challenge, but we wanna engage students as early as we can using mathematics, using common sense, l using their lived experience, using resources that they need to address real problems. So 2014, all, all the titles are nice and catchy. Lunch Crunch, can nutritious be affordable and delicious? I'm not going into the details of things, but I think this looks like some sort of balancing of things, right? Uh, maybe they're looking at data about um, food, calories, this, fat content, and all these things. 2018, better eight than never, reducing food waste. Um, 2020, keep on trucking. U.S. big rigs turnover from diesel to electric. How important is this? 2022, remote work, fat or future. Huh, I wonder where that notion came up about remote work, fat or future, 2022. And 2023, the, um, the challenge was ride like the wind without getting winded, the growth of electric bike use. 
yeah, it was cool to see electric bikes zipping by here in San Francisco yesterday. Um, good. All right, so and a math modeling, of course, is about divining, defining things, assuming things, justifying, solving, analyzing, and communicating. And Siam has um, published some of the math modeling um, handbooks to get started with getting solutions, computing and communication, communicating. Um, you see some of the authors here, Karen Bliss, who is now full-time at Siam as our senior manager of outreach and education and manages the M3 program. You see some names, um, Kay, Kay Fowler, who's the same as Kay Kavanaugh, Katie Kavanaugh. Ben Galuso is here as a GMM this year, and uh, Rachel Levy again. So again, this is, a, this is the quote from the climate change group that I started off with. There's a need to ensure that students in all majors eventually develop an increased awareness of these problems through interdisciplinary course, courses and project work, so they understand their role as citizens and professionals and have the capacity and skills to develop and contribute to the solution. So that is the challenge we want. Now, um, so that's the opinion of that, the climate change group. That's also my opinion. So if only we had a lot of money to survey the general public about what they think is useful in math. If only we had money. But you know who has money? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, I'll, I'll just end with this. Um, so the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, very committed to math education. You may know this. And in 2020, what year is this? 24. I think it's in 2022. They published, uh, the foundation published the um, this report done by um, Market Research or Research Group. GSG, and the need to make math more relevant and engaging for K through 12 students, and the objectives. So this is publicly available. I just took screenshots of some of the slides. The objectives of this market research, or this research survey that they did, is to understand how parents and teachers in the US think about the state of math education today. Again, that's K through 12. I don't see that there's a difference really, about the, about the K through 12 opinions or, and also university opinions, but gauge which skills uh, parents and teachers believe are most important, and they wanted to also understand how parents and teachers want students to experience math in the classroom, including which tools and approaches they think would be most likely to lead to success, right? So it's a nice um, report, and um, you have some key findings, but um, you see this, I didn't bold it, they bolded it. <laughs> Making instruction more engaging, of course. Who doesn't want more engaging instruction? And what? Real world relevant, right? Public believes that most math instructional contest is disconnected from students' lives, right? Missing things out. But I'd like to implore you to do more with real world connections, wh wherever you consider the real world to be. And there's data to support it. And I thank you so much for choosing um, this, and I hope that it was worth your time, and thank you to the AMS um, committee for selecting me. Thanks. We have, a, we have a little bit of time for some questions. Uh, if you have a question, there are two microphones up here. Feel free to come on up and ask you as many questions as you have. Susie, thank Hi. you so much. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, the pick math, I can see how that can scale up mm -hmm. in the various other, because if you train somebody once, so the scale of math professors is not so enormous. Right. What are your thoughts, and this is just thoughts, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not expecting that you thought about it, but I, when you think about high school teachers, we're on a whole nother scale. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the need for bringing modeling in, mm -hmm. in a population that's already really struggling, mm -hmm. how do you see us moving forward and not falling into, you know, bitter arguments? So that? bitter, so, okay. Um, I want to make sure I say something helpful, but there are various groups that are working on this. Tipsy Math is working on this. But yeah, for, uh, I don't have a perfect solution. We keep trying. We provide resources to help. But 
high school teachers are up against the constraint of time, constraint of resources. So I think it's working, if we're talking about public schools, working within the school system. Um, and we have a conference board of mathematical sciences where all the math related um, executive directors and presidents and things get together, doing more of that work, seeing how we can do, how we can all work together. It's not we and us, right? How we can all work together to support that. But, um, and I assume that that's a goal of Bill and Melinda Gates just to help support that, but it is a challenge. And right now, at least even more so post pandemic, then you have the additional um, challenge that teachers, the number of teachers is decreasing, right? So challenge after challenge, but we can't, you know, we can't give up hope, we keep trying, but yeah. And so do, do encourage your students also to become teachers. That's important, right? Yeah. All right, we have another yeah. question over here. Hi, um, Susie, really amazing um, talk. I, uh, some of these things I knew about, but a, a lot I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna ask about one that I, this, again, now I feel like one of my students, this may, the answer may have been on your slide. That's okay. But uh -huh. um, for the, um, for the, in, uh, the SIAM industrial um, summer uh, problem solving things that you do with, um, with graduate students, uh -huh. are any of those, um, like problems or materials available for um, faculty who might want to use them, say in a course project or, mm -hmm. or something, or is it, because um, I know the companies that are there are sometimes like they don't right. want stuff shared. So I'm pretty sure, and Richard is here, and he's gonna, you know Richard, right? Richard yes. will correct me, but um, reports are written, and I think part of when those companies come to us, we're gonna have, you know, people are gonna sit there and discuss it, so it's, it's in a framework that it's already, kind of public, right? Okay. If they have any special data, they're not gonna probably get, at least, this is my experience working on industry projects in the past, mm -hmm. they may not give us the data, right? It could mm -hmm. be assimilated data and things like that. But Richard, do you wanna modify anything? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, and I don't know you. if there's any material from the graduate student math modeling workshop that's ever been put together or published or made available, but. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. And you don't have to have math modeling expertise to participate, choose to, partic to at least apply to participate in the math problems and industry workshop, and please do encourage your graduate students to apply. Um, so one thing I wanted to say is I know, especially with grad students, I know it's like, oh, I want them to spend the summer doing the research, that one research dissertation problem. I've always felt that it's, well, one, the graduate students should just say, no, I'm gonna go do something different in the summer to enhance my marketability. And I also wanna say to those of you of faculty to do please allow them that, that opportunity to go off campus and learn some different skills, right? It's, we're educating them for the rest of their life, and it's not just for that one dissertation. So, okay. Yeah, but a personal story related to that. Mm -hmm. My my oldest daughter uh, got her PhD in math, and and the um, I think it was the summer before, two summers before she finished her PhD, she did an internship at a national lab, and that ended up being her job when she graduated. Yeah. Yeah. And she's very happy with that job. <laughs> yes. And I did an internship at IBM when I was in grad school a million years ago. Have no, there was no internet then, I have no idea. I must have been a flyer somewhere that I picked up and I went off to, um, as even before my preliminary exams and that was, yeah, that was great. Well, let's uh, thank Susie again for her presentation.